The history of the old American West is full of stories of gunmen, cowboys, Indians, and lawmen. But some have become famous, and their characters have become true Western legends. This video is brought to you by Magellan TV. With one of the most diverse catalogs in the internet, Magellan TV is the right streaming platform for you as a history buff. The Magellan TV catalog has over 3,000 documentaries from many different genres, such as history, science and technology, travel and adventure, true crime, art and culture, and much more. You will find numerous documentaries about wars, biographies, ancient and modern history, archaeology, and other topics. Dozens of hours of new content are added weekly, and you will never run out of new content to watch. For those who like documentaries about great characters of literature, I recommend watching We Are Legends. In this miniseries, you will find out how Dracula, Tarzan, and Sherlock Holmes went from book characters to true icons of pop culture. The Magellan TV app is very easy to use and works on any device. You can even cast from your phone to your TV. So check it out now and benefit a special holiday offer. Buy one, get one free gift card for an annual membership by clicking on the link in the description. William Bonney, better known as Billy the Kid, is one of the most famous criminals in history. With his youth, audacity, and violence, his deeds continue to be told today. Despite earning fame in the Wild West, Billy was born in New York in 1859, where he lived his childhood. His baptismal name was Henry McCarthy. With the death of his father, the family moved to Indiana, where his mother remarried. Then, they moved to the West. But when Billy was 14, his mother died of tuberculosis in New Mexico. Orphaned, Billy began to commit petty crimes. Together with a friend, he ended up in jail for theft. The prison bars were unable to hold Billy for long. The boy escaped the arms of the law for the first time. William Bonney fled to Arizona, where he became a horse thief. It was there that he committed his first murder. Billy got involved in a bar brawl with a local bully, the blacksmith Francis Cahill. During the fight, the boy was thrown to the ground. To prevent Francis from stealing his gun, Billy shot him in the belly. Some witnesses said it was an act of self-defense, but Billy was accused of murder. The young man returned to New Mexico but almost died in the desert when the Apache Indians stole his horse and left him on foot in the desert. On his return to New Mexico, Billy was hired by the Englishman John Tunstall, an emerging cattle baron who treated Billy with respect, something unusual in his life. But the Englishman had a huge conflict with the economic elite of Lincoln County. Tensions between rival groups rapidly increased. In 1878, John Tunstall was murdered by gunmen hired by his rivals. Part of the population and Tunstall's men demanded justice. But the men of the law, including Sheriff William Brady, were bought by Lincoln's elite. To avenge their boss's death, Billy the Kid, his mates, and some Lincoln citizens created an armed group known as the Regulators. It was the beginning of the Lincoln County War. The Regulators hunted down the men responsible for John Tunstall's death. Billy and his companions were eliminating one by one the boss's executioners, including Sheriff Brady and his deputy, subservient to the local elite. Both were killed in an ambush. On June 14, 1878, a major shooting took place between the Regulators and the forces of the new sheriff, George Pepin. This conflict became known as the Battle of Lincoln. The shooting in the city lasted about five days. The Regulators seemed to have the upper hand, but the Sheriff received reinforcements. Soldiers from Fort Stanton's army cornered Billy and his companions in a building. The building where the Regulators were entrenched was fully surrounded and set on fire to force the gunmen out. Billy the Kid volunteered to attract the attention of the soldiers and citizens surrounding the building, creating a small window of opportunity for his colleagues to escape. Many of his colleagues died in the Battle of Lincoln, but Billy and some friends managed to escape alive. Due to the large number of people involved in the Lincoln County War, 
a large amnesty was decreed for the crimes perpetrated during the conflict. But Billy's name was not among the amnesty recipients. He was considered a wanted outlaw. Billy the Kid tried to negotiate his amnesty with Governor Lou Wallace, promising to testify in the case of the barbaric murder of a renowned lawyer. William Bonney turned himself in to the authorities and testified before the jury as arranged. However, the promised amnesty did not happen. Billy was arrested, but escaped again. News about Billy the Kid were scarce for some time, but he couldn't stay out of trouble for long. In a saloon in New Mexico, a man seemed to be watching out for Billy. The boy noticed his restlessness and approached him friendly, praising the man's beautiful weapon. Billy asked to see that gem and the guy accepted. William Bonney realized that the gun had three bullets and gave it back to the man. The man pointed the gun treacherously to Billy's head and fired. But the smart boy had changed the position of the revolver drum. One of the empty cylinders of the gun was triggered. Billy the Kid showed no mercy and shot the aggressor in the head. New Mexico's governor established a $500 bounty hunt for anyone who captured the criminal William Bonney and brought him to justice. Quickly, Lincoln's new sheriff, Pat Garrett, took over the mission to capture Billy the Kid. The sheriff and his men managed to corner Billy and his remaining companions and bring them to justice, where they would be tried and sentenced to hang for the death of Sheriff Brady. Everything indicated that this would be the end of the brave gunfighter. Under the constant vigilance of two delegates, the hanging seemed like a sure fate. But using his cunning and violence, Billy managed to escape again, leaving two more victims behind. But Sheriff Pat Garrett was determined not to allow this boy to escape again. There were rumors that Billy was hiding in the house of a friend in common with the sheriff. Pat Garrett set up the ambush. During the night, Billy entered his friend's house and saw a man in the shadows. In Spanish, the boy asked who was there. When he recognized Billy's voice, the sheriff shot the outlaw in the chest. It was the end of the most famous bandit of the Old West. Billy the Kid was only 21 years old. The young bandit's fame had already spread throughout the United States. The legends about him further increased the myth of the young gunman. In the following decades, dozens of books and movies told of the young gunslinger's adventure, often portrayed as a hero. Even with such a short career, Billy the Kid left his mark on history. He is a true legend of the Old West. In 1863, the country was divided into a civil war. Brothers were fighting among themselves. The war had been going on for some years, and the Union forces had expelled the Confederate troops from the state of Missouri. In this context, Jesse James, only 16, joined the Bushwhackers, a guerrilla group fighting against the federal occupation. These small guerrilla squads used to ambush the invaders from the north. These actions were known for their violence. But despite their brutality, these men had the support of part of the local population, who often saw them as heroes. The war between the Union and the Confederates had already ended, but in Missouri, the Bushwhackers continued to fight the invaders. With the death of the guerrilla group's leader, and after being seriously wounded in a gunfight, Jesse James was forced to swear loyalty to the Union and to lower his weapons. His injuries were treated by his cousin, Zerelda Mims, whom Jesse would eventually marry. After the war, Missouri tried to return to normality, but the Civil War had left its scars. The resentments caused by the war divided the population. The defeated Confederates were subjugated to those who supported the Union. A new battle that would pit brothers against brothers could break out at any moment. In this scenario, Jesse James and his brother Frank opposed the current order and decided to become outlaws. In the following years, the James brothers robbed several small banks. Despite these actions, Jesse James was still unknown, and his name was not linked to any of these robberies. In 1869, Jesse and Frank robbed the place where Samuel Cox, the man who killed the Bushwhackers' leader, was working. In this robbery, Jesse mistakenly killed the bank clerk, thinking that this was Cox. During the escape, 
Jesse screamed euphorically, believing he avenged the death of his former leader. It was this crime that popularized Jesse James. The story of Jesse James's robbery and revenge reached the ears of John Newman Edwards, editor of the Kansas City Times and advocate of the Confederate cause. Jesse was the hero he needed to rekindle the flame of Southern pride. The James brothers accepted their fate as Southern heroes and focused on attacking Northern ventures. They robbed banks, stagecoaches, and railway companies of the wealthy Northern businessmen. Jesse James seemed to enjoy fame. Several witnesses stated that Jesse used to tell the victims that they should feel honored to be robbed by the famous Jesse James. In exchange for their belongings, he gave them a great story to tell. Part of the Southern population believed that Jesse James was some kind of hero. He was hailed as a Wild West Robin Hood. Jesse James came to believe in the mythology that surrounded him. But Jesse James was no hero. His actions were not guided by honor or virtue. His criminal and violent acts were motivated by resentment and a desire for revenge. He was a cold-blooded killer. Several of his victims were unarmed in their last moments of life. The governor of Missouri decreed a $2,000 bounty hunt in exchange for Jesse James's head. But the population and local law enforcement ignored or even protected Jesse James and his brother. The state's inability to solve the James's brother's issue allowed private enterprise to take over the task. The entrepreneurs who had their businesses damaged by Jesse's gang came together. They hired the National Detective Agency Pinkerton to fulfill the mission. Alan Pinkerton sent one of his best agents to find the James brothers. Although experienced, the agent underestimated the support the James family had in the region. The outsider raised suspicion due to his overly inquisitive questions. The agent was shot, and his dead body had a note in his pocket. It said, this is what happens to anyone who challenges the James. But Alan Pinkerton did not allow his company to be humiliated in that way. The Pinkertons surrounded the James brothers' mother's house for revenge. They threw incendiary items to force the bandits to leave the residence. One of these artifacts exploded and killed the younger James, who was still a child. The mother's arm was also cut off. The two brothers were not at home. The Pinkertons' disastrous action tarnished the company's reputation, which led them to walk away from the case. This episode further enhanced Jesse James's reputation. He became a Confederate hero, persecuted by the evil forces in the North. The population came to admire his actions even more. Jesse James brought together a group of reputed Confederate bandits for one of his main assaults until that point. The target was the first national bank in Northfield, a bank whose partners were reputed politicians with ties to the North. It was an excellent target for a publicity stunt for the Southern cause. The people of Northfield realized that the assault was being prepared and organized to repel the bandits. The citizens triggered a massive shootout on the city streets. The assault was a massive failure. Several of Jesse James's compatriots were killed. The brothers managed to escape, but practically without having robbed anything. Jesse James's gang was captured and extinguished. It was the beginning of the fall of a myth. The James brothers remained hidden for some time near Nashville using false identities. Frank James got sick of the crime life and started to enjoy his new quiet and common daily routine. But the same did not happen with his brother. Jesse put together another group to rob trains, but the synergy between these new bandits was not the same Jesse had with his old guerrillas. But the political scene in Missouri had changed. The former Confederates regained political power in the region. The figure of the bandit and rebel Confederate was now a problem for the new political class. A great bounty hunt was announced for anyone who captured or killed any of the James brothers. The reward made Jesse James more and more paranoid. Without his brother Frank at his side, Jesse James relied only on two of his fellow brothers, Charlie and Robert Ford. But he didn't know that Robert Ford conspired together with Governor Thomas Crittenden. The goal was to betray Jesse and keep the whole bounty hunt for himself. Jesse James planned his next coup without suspecting that the enemy was inside his house, waiting for the perfect opportunity to attack. 
Jesse grabbed his weapons and put them on the furniture because he was preparing for a trip and feared that the neighbors would feel threatened by seeing a man heavily armed entering and leaving the house. He climbed into a chair to clean a dusty painting and Robert Ford noticed the opportunity. He shot the unarmed Jesse James in the back and killed one of the greatest legends in the West. The murder of Jesse James caused a great stir and was news all over the USA and abroad. Hundreds of people surrounded the house where he was murdered to try to see Jesse's body. Robert Ford was tried and sentenced to death for the murder, but received a full pardon from the governor. He would become known as the man who killed Jesse James. Ford would be murdered years later by Edward O'Kelly. After killing Robert Ford, he proclaimed himself the man who killed the man who killed Jesse James. The conspiracy over the murder of Jesse James increased the legend of the man who fought against the powerful. Whether as a hero fighting an oppressive system or as a violent outlaw and cruel killer, Jesse James wrote his name among the great legends of the West. William Frederick Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill, is one of the most famous names among Wild West legends. His reputation doesn't come from being a famous gunman, a legendary sheriff, or an outlaw. His true legacy was to have managed to solidify these mythical figures of the American Wild West in the imagination of a nation. William was born in 1846 in the territory of Iowa, son of a Canadian merchant and an American teacher. When Bill was still a child, his parents took part in the abolitionist movement. The United States was going through a delicate political moment and a civil war was about to erupt. At the center of this conflict was the issue of slavery. While making a pro-abolition speech, Isaac Cody, the father of little William, was stabbed. Isaac would die sometime later from medical problems resulting from the attack. At the age of 11, Bill became responsible for supporting his family. He got a job as a helper messenger at Pony Express. This company traveled through hostile territories to deliver express mail in the form of messages and packages. Bill tried to join the army at the age of 14, but was turned down because he was too young. Still, the persistent William got a job as a civilian servant, as a scout for the Union Army. Armed with his 50 caliber Springfield rifle, which he would name Lucretia Borgia, Bill became a legendary buffalo hunter. William would become known for his accuracy and the large number of animals slaughtered to feed the Union Army. Due to his fame as a buffalo hunter, he became known as Buffalo Bill. In just eight months, he killed over 4,000 buffalo to feed the Kansas Pacific Railroad workers. But there was another buffalo hunter named William, who claimed to be the real Buffalo Bill. To settle the dispute for the title, William Cody and William Comstock competed to find out who killed the most buffalo. Cody killed 68 bison in only eight hours of competition, one every seven minutes. His rival killed 48, and William Buffalo Bill Cody won his epithet. As a civilian servant of the Union Army, William spotted an Indian ready to ambush members of the 3rd Cavalry Regiment. With a precise long-distance shot, he eliminated the threat and saved the lives of his companions. Buffalo Bill would be awarded the Medal of Honor for his acts of bravery. From 1868 to 1972, already as a soldier, William Cody fought in the Indian Wars and participated in retaliation against the Indians in response to the massacre of Custer's troops during the Battle of the Little Bighorn. William Cody was famous in the American West, but his destiny was stardom. In 1869, Ned Buntland wrote about the adventures of Buffalo Bill the king of border men. The author talked about Bill's greatest accomplishments, exaggerating or even inventing most of them. In 1872, Ned invited Bill to perform in a play that would reconstitute the stories of the Wild West. William would play himself. Although he had never performed before and his first performances were particularly amateurish, Buffalo Bill had a magnetic presence on stage. Bill performed for 10 years in this Wild West show, where his main role was to reconstitute the battle in which he scalped the Cheyenne Indian warrior Yellowhair. William Cody realized the commercial potential of this kind of show and decided to invest in a new venture. 
1883, he created Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. His great outdoor show had the participation of hundreds of artists. Buffalo Bill's cast traveled all over the country with his show, presenting battles between cowboys and Indians, reconstitutions of grand stagecoach assaults, and buffalo hunts. Adults and children were amazed to see live the stories they read in newspapers and magazines. William Cody allowed the Indians to show their own culture to the country, portraying them as great warriors and owners of a rich cultural tradition. Among these Indians was the legendary Sioux Chief Sitting Bull. Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows crystallized into American imagery, the cowboys as heroes of the borders, but also reinforced the image of the role of Indians as villains in these narratives. After conquering America, Buffalo Bill took his group on a tour of Europe, where they had a show scheduled before Queen Victoria in the Jubilee of her reign. However, a serious railroad accident was the beginning of the end of Buffalo Bill's great show. Incredibly, the accident did not kill anyone, but caused the loss of more than a hundred animals, including Bill's two mounts, the famous Old Pap and Old Eggle. Also, one of the most famous stars of the show, the well-known shooter Annie Oakley, was seriously injured. Bill's show would recover from the tragedy, but several unsuccessful investments by Bill bankrupted him and his show was sold at auction to pay off his debts. Buffalo Bill died at the age of 70. His greatest legacy was the consolidation of American mythology, whose heroes were cowboys, gunmen, Indians, and soldiers. These men became true legends of the West. When I was still a boy, my father told me how the great spirits had promised us all the land where we lived. Our people felt the richest in the world. All that land provided us with plenty, much more than we needed. Our people lived by plowing corn and hunting buffalo, just like our predecessors. Almost all parts of the great animal were used. But this life in harmony with our land was perennially threatened by the white man, who spread and degraded the land they occupied. But our people did not allow our sacred lands to be desecrated by white men in their sick search for the yellow metal. My father was a great warrior, but without the arm he had lost in the fight against the crows, he could no longer fight on horseback. Therefore, he was responsible for defending the tribe in the absence of the warriors. My father took us to the camp of our Cheyenne allies. But we were not prepared for the scenario we would encounter. Without their warriors, the defenseless camp of our friends was devastated. Old men, women, and children were torn apart by the sabers of the blue-coated warriors. I carry that terrible image with me until this very day. It's a rare night when I don't have nightmares about that. Those lands were no longer safe. We decided to leave for Black Hill, the sacred mountains. It was there that we saw the silhouettes of a group of warriors. Their long-brimmed hats indicated they were white men. The blue coats looked at us like hungry wolves before a defenseless prey. Like wild beasts, they set off to attack at the sound of their metallic instrument, which anticipated the arrival of the spirits of death. My father ordered us to form a defensive circle, using our belongings as cover. I was given a rifle, too heavy for a boy my size. I was already trying to aim and shoot, but my father shouted for me to wait until the enemy came closer, as I would only have one chance to hit the target. The white warriors rode around our defenses, roaring wildly. A knight advanced against me, and his bloodthirst look made my knees tremble. But I was the son of the singing eagle. Courage was in our blood, and so I kept my position. I still remember my father's proud look when he saw his little son knocking down the white warrior. My father did everything he could to defend our people, but the blue coats were numerous. My father fell, protecting his friends and family. Our arrows and bullets were vanishing. The end was near. Suddenly, the earth began to shake and the white men felt frightened. 
a large group of Sioux warriors emerged. With their powerful war cries, they put an end to the white warriors' courage. Many bluecoats tried to run away, but several tasted the fury of our warriors. I knelt beside my father, who was dying. He still managed to say that his departure was a happy one, knowing that his boy was now a man and a future great warrior. The Sioux warriors returned after chasing the bluecoats, and among all the warriors, one stood out. He was the Sitting Bull, the great warrior and spiritual leader of the Lakota. Under his command, the Sioux and Cheyenne opposed the relentless advance of the white men. They were unwilling to give up their lands and renounce their lifestyle without fighting. Olá, amigos mamíferos! Vocês acabaram de assistir o prólogo do nosso mais novo projeto, As Lendas do Velho Oeste. Nesta nova série, com artes de Rafael Grit e cores de Fabi Marx, iremos conhecer um pouco da vida dos maiores heróis e vilões do Velho Oeste. Cowboys, pistoleiros, homens da lei, famosos ladrões de bancos e os mais bravos guerreiros indígenas. Mostre que você é rápido no gatilho e se inscreva logo no canal. E não se esqueça de conferir os quadrinhos que já estão à venda na Amazon. Os links estão aqui na descrição. Um abraço de foca e até a próxima!